entire organizing committee i mr ravi kumar organizing secretary would like to welcome you all for this conference so ladies and gentlemen let me introduce about arsss uh, the motion behind uh, motive behind this uh, con i mean academic uh, conferences uh, association is that to bridge gap between the students profession academicians industrialists and uh, multidisciplinary so apart from organizing various seminar expert talks and conferences we have various highly rated multidisciplinary journals uh, in the field of science engineering technology and management so since the inception we have been arranging the various international conferences at various part of the world in across the globe like uh, new york london in australia new, uh, dubai bangkok and also in uh, india and many other places so we have like more than 1 lakh people associated across the globe with us and uh, more than 50000 research uh, papers have been published uh, and has been presented in this particular journey of uh, 10 plus years so today i am glad to welcome you all as a member of this fastest growing network for the advancement in science and technology in terms of research and innovation so uniqueness of this particular conference of this academic world is basically we will be having interdisciplinary conferences where people from across the globe we have seen here they'll be coming in presenting their research paper of their different free, uh, stream so that we will get to interact with the people out across the globe and then understand uh, our uh, you know uh, uh, understand what's happening across the research across the globe in interdisciplinary field so with this opportunity i would like to welcome every everyone out here and we will quickly start with the session for the day as you all are aware we have like almost like uh, 30 plus participants uh, and 30 plus papers right as to stick to the time right we will try to see how the, uh, we have less participants around 17 participants and uh, speakers are also joining uh, you know uh, listeners are also joining in this meet right let us just go ahead and start the presentation quickly one of the the other right and let us stick to the time limit and we will at the eight minutes is maximum for each presentation we can give right and apart from this uh, the, let us have this question and answer session offline that is through chat box and through email basically once you present i request you to share your email address out here and then the participants can mail to you and have connect to you and understand how the research is going on and then also collaborate with your organization so that a multidisciplinary and you know university collaborations academic collaborations across the globe uh, can also take in place in this particular platform so request you to share your email address out here once you are done with your presentation right and people can ask you questions and we can just go ahead accordingly so i start with the presentation for the day right i call upon the first presenter to come forward and uh, present uh, and start presenting the session right uh, i will call the first present join abdullah hakim uh, are you here Thank you uh, hello everyone uh, now i am speaking today i'm speaking a uh, brain and the words so um, art and science uh, is a very 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 popular uh, two item and uh, have developed free from each other and uh, did not have much interaction until the second half of the 20th century the strict lines that were drawn between art and science uh, become less dis distinct uh, it was until the end of the 20th century that academy recognized the brain as the creative power behind art and culture So today the two art and brain we are studied uh, and uh, we uh, the brain affect art and it return how did the affect the brain this is the question today for me uh, the term covers neuro aesthetic is the new uh, cold uh, study image it so the term covers uh, art brain and neurology Uh, literature is a form of art that is not as straightforward as the other art forms like painting music dance can be viewed uh, painting and dance can hear heard and which makes them perceivable 
And the occipital and auditory cortex send messages to the brain. Uh, and literature, on the other hand, involves a visual act, but unlike a painting, the reader sends input to the brain in terms of words, not a tangible object, as it's in the case of painting. They are not the same. Music is different, painting is different, and reading is different for the brain. Then these need to be semantically decoded by neurons. Furthermore, uh, as semantic decoding is realized, the reader, even if not in all cases, develops mental images about what she has read. The object of these visual images is not really seen. So this is uh, very, very important because literature can paint pictures, but literary language is not a painting or not a music. So even though we may think that is mental imagery may involve the visual cortex, it's not, mm -mm, it really is not. So reading, yeah, we all have um, books and words, we love, reading, but reading, especially reading literature, is not an act that every human is engaged in. Unlike most unconsciously accurate acts such as learning a language, learning to read requires conscious learning. However, learning to read changes the brain. So Burke postulates the literature reading begins when the reader's eye meets the words, then the brain, body and mind actively continue. He claims that there are four stages of this reading process. Pre-reading, which is before the eyes meet the written words, actually reading. Post-reading, that is when the eyes leaves the written word and non-reading. Non-reading is interesting in the sense that reader continues to read in implicit memory. Burke uses the term oceanic literature reading to explain the cognitive interaction with the brain while the processing the literary text. So you can see the uh, picture, your brain reading a book. This term underlines the idea that the brain is a very dynamic state shifting between different areas of the brain to ensure that there is effective cognition. The idea that the whole brain is activated while the reader is fully engaged in literary reading and supported by a highly technical study conducted by Natalie Phillips in 2015. So if we show the uh, fMRI study involved the literature majors who read a Jane Austen novel while their blood flow and the activities in different sections of their brain were recorded. The results was very interesting, revealed that the whole brain seemed to change when fully reading a book. It was determined that the brain section responsibly for an emotional charge, as was expected, light up. However, surprisingly, the motor control center and the spatial reasoning areas were also activated in a way showing that the reader was using these centers for help. And the studies in literary neuroaesthetic revealed another interesting fact about literary reading, mental imagery. The reader creates a mental image of where, how, and who of the story she is reading. Kuzmikova hypnosis is that the reader remembers this mental imagery the most once the reading is finished. This is the idea can be affirmed by asking questions to a reader when she was viewed a film made of favorite book. Most probably the answers will be this actor does not really fit the character or I do not think that is how the physical world should look like. Holland claims that we create and recreate literature because we enjoy it. It gives us pleasure, fun, enjoy, if the literature can provide us with such pleasure, then it's worth studying in terms of how it gives us pleasure. So therefore it merits careful research and consideration. There's also a group, literature critics, who do not consider neuroaesthetics as a proper research discipline. 
Those posted questions about what constitutes an aesthetic experience. He claims that most research measures prevents is a conducted uh, manner, therefore lacks standardization. He suggests that those in the field should first converse with human research in field of aesthetics and arts. So the present study has just gained a surface of the research conducted in understanding the relationship between the written word and the brain. There are many, many questions to be answered and more research to be conducted in order to achieve a unified view of it's all possible. And thank you for me to listening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your wonderful presentation, ma'am. Uh, so on what basis uh, this particular research, uh, you know, like uh, what literatures, have you referred to conclude this uh, or come to the conclusions? Uh, basically, I wanted to understand that uh, and the overall glimpse of uh, right the implementations or the effects a uh, little bit. You can show throw some light on it. Yes, um, now um, I I am in Turkey now, so uh, this um, sessions, the studies, uh, I would like to uh, make with Turkish people too, because we have a different music, different type of words, different type of everything different. So uh, with Asian people, with Europe people, uh, I, I would definitely do it uh, for myself uh, with the study too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Wonderful presentation. And also, uh, like which background uh, are you, I mean, in this paper is basically uh, technology, like how can you integrate uh, other technologies out here, say, you know, uh, different technologies for uh, like they, scope of work? They are using fMRI systems and EEG systems, uh, sometimes um, CTT systems, uh, and, uh, but basically fMRI systems, they are using it. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, wonderful presentation. A nice okay. interacting with you. Please share your email address. We'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, next, uh, I would like to call upon, uh, now we will just next call upon uh, Faisal uh, Deep Neural Network based uh, intrusion detection system, a comparative analysis. Do we have them here? Okay. I will share it. Okay, so Natalia, Natalia Drab, uh, mathematical modeling of profitability area. They have not had come. Okay, awareness of cyber security in society. Abdullah, okay. deep neural network uh, based intrusion detection system, a comparative analysis. Okay, let me now go for the next participant. Do we have Sunil Kumar? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I'm there. Yeah, please share your presentation, sir. Uh, is this my presentation is visible? Yes, yes, please go ahead. Hi, very good afternoon here. All the distinguished researcher uh, coordinator. I'm Sunil Kumar Mahobia, I'm a PhD scholar. My topic for this presentation is the identification of the glycated hemoglobin with the help of advanced miniaturized cost-effective polymeric biosensor. Basically, we know the diabetic, basically it's impacted a lot to uh, not only the India, but all across the world. And we have seen that some of the conventional biosensor which is available here, they are unable to fulfill the requirement that is needed to do the proper testing. Like the conventional fasting plasma glucose test, it is a very tedious process for the patient. They have to go for the long hours of the fasting requirement. They have to do the multiple time test in order to take the blood. They have to go with the again and again painful process. So then WHA has come up with the HbA1c biosensor test, which is a very highly advanced uh, version of this thing and you don't need to go for the multiple time of testing because this HbA1c compound when the glucose molecules combine with our hemoglobin molecule 
then this hb hb one c complex is formation is happening so this will give you the perfect and very high accurate result and we can also understand what is the average blood sugar level since the last 2 to 3 months so this developing a uh, miniaturized sensor we have uh, utilizing with the help of nanotechnology and this hb one c biosensor using that magnetic nanoparticle and the polymeric material that we have tuned so what the material that we have utilized it is a methacrylic acid tryptophan valine egdma aibn that is like azobis butanitrile methanol and the tetracyl for the other combination of the uh, to synthesize this nanoparticle and the nip we have utilization uh, we have taken that uh, ferrous chloride nh solution so what kind of the method methodology we have taken in order to uh, complete this biosensor technique which can be very cost effective same time it will give you the very high precision rate because since it is a polymer material so this analyte substrate which is going to be uh, this uh, imprinting happening into the polymer material so that sensitivity and selectivity of the molecule become very high so we have taken that screen printed electrode then after that we have deposited that rn nanoparticle and then we have deposited our polymeric material where it is a cryptosyl valine our compound was there and after this template removing we have then cavity formation is happened so after this thing we done some uh, characterization technique and electrochemical analysis so uh, cb we have took place so cyclic voltammetric test we have taken and this will going to be give you a little bit of picture when we have taken the bare electrode that current intensity was not here that oxidation reduction peak peak was just nearly 1.5 so when we have incorporated that rn nanoparticle we have seen the sharp increasing the oxidation reduction peak toward that 2.5 uh, oxidation and minus 2.4 once we have incorporated the polymeric material we have reduced the slight reduction of the electrical conductivity because the polymeric material is not that much of conductive so since we have seen the reduction in oxidation and reduction peak but once we have removed uh, this template that mip is washed out then we have seen that increase in the current then the same way that we have taken that esi so we have seen here the impedance the larger impedance it means that current uh, conductivity was very low so in the bear it was a very low conductivity compared to that when we have incorporated that iron nano particle and once we have removed that mip uh, template so we have seen the both the case there is a low impedance rate so this is the things that we have identified see that uh, performance of the sensor with respect to the oxidation reduction peak and impedance analysis then further we have done uh, for the glycated hemoglobin chronometry test so we have seen and we have taken the range from uh, 0.01 picomolar to 1000 picomolar we have seen the and the lower concentration the concentration of the electricity is very high and gradually as we are increasing the concentration from 0.1 to 1 and 1 micromolar so it will keep on going to be increase so the same way we have seen here that hb1c concentration study we have done with the asi technique ranging from 1 picomolar to 1.1 uh, multiplied by 10 to the 5 picomolar with the range of uh, minus 2 plus 100 megahertz so we have seen here that the slightly it is the lower detection limit we have identified with the 1 picomolar here and the following results we have identified that square root analysis we have seen it is a correlation we have seen with that scan rate and that optimization studies has been done for the ph and temperature key what is that stability of our sensor which particular ph it will going to be performed so we have seen into the room temperature 30 degree it is a very high uh, electrical conductivity we have seen and the ph also which is resemblance with our blood sample that uh, blood is also uh, ph ranges from the 7.25 to 7.5 so we have seen that our sensor is performing very well in the real time sample as well and we have optimized this thing from the uh, some of the diagnostic lab and we have seen that some of the interference test also ki which particular parameter if it is increased or decreased so this uh, temperature perform this sensor performance is going to be impact so we have seen that maximum is cholesterol and lower in uric acid then uh, followed by that acetylcholine enzyme and ascorbic acid the conclusion we come up with this sensor is very much cost effective since we are utilizing the polymeric material and the self life is very high so that makes also very much cost effective and we have wide reduction range from 1 picomolar to 1.5 picomolar and we have that uh, lower detection limit is very much precise so that will give the high precision then iron nanoparticle it will increase that facilitate of the electron transfer rate and high surface area so that is the how we have incorporated this technology 
and uh, we have utilizing very minimum blood sample and not of time lot of time blood sample you don't need to take only one time within a three months it is a more than enough so miniaturization of this biosensor make is portable and user friendly and early diagnosis for monitoring for the diabetic why it is important because when the diabetic convert into the secondary complication it will be a life threatening condition like the heart attack kidney failure neurological problem eye damage and the foot damage so this is how we are trying to prevent the society not to go for the secondary complication by detecting uh, their diabetic label in a more convenient and a most cost effective way so uh, this is all over the project that we have conducted with the help of uh, dst uh, and byrac and iac technologies private limited so these are the things that we have completed thank you so much if there is any question you can ask Yeah. Uh, so, similar there. Yeah. So just wanted to understand, like you know, um, the implementations or the difficulties uh, of real real time implementation of your research. And uh, basically, your title is so nice that basically you are focusing on uh, the health uh, point of view, uh, right? It's really nice. Uh, so, uh, how is it uh, planning to you know implementation perspective? How are you? planning uh, with respect to the next level of the research so uh, we are basically so collaborating this is the basically government funded project under dst so uh, we are further once this lab test is going to be optimized and currently matches with the diagnostic report and all that we have did so further it will going to be taken to the miniaturization and other parts so further we will take into the commercialization and we will try to deploy into the some of the hospitals as well and this is how we are going to be planning for the next step for to make it available for the mass uh, population and all so this is the two uh, things that we have uh, thought it out ki how we can actually go into the go to market strategy we have come up with so further it is a lab based so like we are trying to miniaturize and convert into that portable devices this format that we have planned it out sounds good sounds good great um, nice to hear about your research and your uh, good so much, uh, work uh, we'll see uh, like you know you have a good uh, collaboration if any other papers you get to work with another things uh, different people to collaborate and make it a, a you know uh, join because there are indo uh, the researchers are also founded in such a way that in nowadays different like indo german like that uh, you know um, different in uh, korea uh, uh, and india like that the funding and all will be happening you can also focus on those type of universities uh, like india government also will be funding and some university collaborations you can plan with this similar research right you can work out for uh, the next level uh, advancement of this good Definitely. work uh, good work thank you thank you thank you so much sir thank you very much yeah. thank you so much for giving this opportunity yeah my pleasure thank you so thank we'll, you so much, yes nice presentation now we'll just go ahead with the next presentation for the day i call upon uh, our next presenter uh, dr sunil do we have uh, hussein um, in a uh, Yeah, Hussein. Yes, 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 sir. I am. Yes, sir. So, so please doctor, share your presentation, sir. Okay. Can you see my presentation? Yes, yes. Please go ahead. Hello, everybody. My name is Hussein Al Musawi. I am a master student at uh, Karabük University in Turkey. Today, I will talk about hybrid malware detection and classification in real time by deep learning techniques. I will begin uh, by introducing malware, after which I will show the problem statement as well uh, as our primary goal in addressing these issues. After that, I will demonstrate how we have built up the data set and I will uh, describe the methods that have been used to categorize and detect malware, as well as the result that we have obtained and the conclusion that have been drawn. Malware is a program or file that is manufactured by people called hackers to carry out a specific purpose, such as spying on certain computers and stealing your private information. And in this case, it is called a spyware or encrypting certain information and uh, demanding a certain amount to retrieve it. And it is uh, called ransomware. According to the report of the AV Test Institute, malware has increased dramatically during the last 10 years, as shown in this figure. 
the institute records more than 450,000 new malware and potentially unwanted application every day. Now, an examin examination of harmful software split in two categories, static analysis and dynamic analysis, with the difference depending on whether the program is really run. Static analysis is a quick and effective, but it, it, it's ineffectual when harm, harmful code is uh, obfuscated. Obfuscation is a method of changing or adding to the original code without changing how the program works. In this case, the solution uses a dynamic analysis method to find malware by monitoring its action while it's running. The program statement in this study is uh, it is difficult to detect a zero, uh, zero day because the malware often has no signature in anti-malware databases and uh, the obfuscation techniques uh, that, that the hackers use to prevent static code analyzers to identifying harmful data. Our objectives in this research uh, uh, to collect samples, malware and benigns and convert it uh, first to image and second, extract API called sequences for each samples to create a new two data sets and develop two different models of deep learning uh, based on static and dynamic analysis to detect malware and uh, use techniques uh, uh, that use to, uh, to protect and uh, use techniques to hit itself to overcome the zero day. Data collection. The virus share website which is a store of uh, malware samples for researchers working in the field of information security was used to gather uh, 7,513 uh, malicious portable executable files, while 1,000 of the benign files were collected from the site so that the, cl the classification became uh, 30 categories as shown in this table. This table shows the samples we, uh, we are collected, collected in the first and in the first data set Every file was changed into grayscale image using the approach described by the researcher Nataraj and others in 2011. The binary malware was turned into an 8-bit vector and then 8-bit vector was converted to an image as shown in, a figure, in this figure. The final image is made of integers between 0 and 255 since each pixel in the image is made up of 8-bit. This is the samples of the malware converted to the image. It belongs to uh, families, ACO and Autoran. In the second data set, uh, using the pfile library, which is a Python library that lets you read and work with portable executable files, the first 50 API called sequences were extracted from each file to decrease complexity and discover the harmful pattern as fast as possible. When it comes to recognizing and categorizing malicious software, one of the most important and often used uh, strategies in deep learning is known as convolutional neural network or CNN. As seen in figure, convolutional layers, pooling layers, and fully connected layers are the three types of layers that are used by CNN. In the convolution layers, kernels are utilized and to build a two-dimension activation map, each filter is convolved across the spatial dimensions of the input data. And the pooling layers, uh, use of the down sampling technique on the input dimension. Next, the fully connected layers will try to build the class that can be applied to the data to categorize it. As shown in figure, the proposed, our proposed model has the three layers of convolution layers, and six layers of uh, max pooling and a fully connected layer. The last layer uses a soft max activation function uh, for classification because we have 30 classes. Another uh, technique used in the deep learning is LSTM. It is a long short term memory, one of the kind of the recurrent neural network. Uh, in contrast to the more common uh, feed forward neural networks, it's also capable of dealing with the data streams such as audio and the graphics. LSTM used for a lot of different things such as recognizing handwriting, speech recognition, and finding anomalies as we, as can be seen in this figure, HCL. It's, uh, that makes of, uh, up of a conventional LSTM unit is made of three gates, an input gate, an output gate, and the for gate. The for gate, uh, gate is responsible for determining which pieces of information need to be taken into consideration. 
Our methodology in this research, two models of deep learning techniques was used to detect malware as shown in figure. The first model CNN technology was built using the first data set, which was made up of image of both malicious and goodware software. And the first model initialized initially uh, image were pre-processing, including resizing the image to 150 by 150 pixels and normaliz normalization was done. And the second model, which is uh, LSTM technology was used with the second data set uh, that include API call sequences. The models is made up of uh, an embedding layer, LSTM layer with 64 cells with a linear activation function and a Dennis layer with a soft max classification for multi-class. In the end, after training the two models, they have been applied to classifying and detecting malware in real time. The programming language Python was used to run the experience in a, on Jupyter uh, notebook. And uh, we noticed that after testing the CNN model with a total of 50 epochs, it had an accuracy 98%. Uh, the suggested LSTM also was evaluated using 30 epochs for the second model, and the result shows an accuracy 99%. And that is the result of our uh, research. As you can uh, see in the figures, this is the first model, CNN models, and the accuracy is uh, reached to 98%. And this is uh, for LSTM model, the second uh, model, and the accuracy is reached to 99% uh, for detecting and classification uh, malwares. This study demonstrated that the second model built with the LSTM technology has the highest accuracy. Our results show that two models are better than one model, uh, model. If the first model don't uh, detect malware, the other model can, especially if the malware is encrypted or uses obfuscation technique. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Hussein. Wonderful work with respect to your uh, presentation. Uh, so uh, nice uh, concept of uh, detection of malware, right? Uh, so wanted to understand like what are the future work and uh, implementations of your uh, dnn uh, uh, network i mean dnn uh, technique which you are planning to use uh, uh, for, for uh, the next yes. level and uh, can uh, i you know as we say malware detection is most important and protection of data is also very much important for us right uh, uh, so what are the uh, implementations or difficulties where i can look into or faces a uh, face with your research or go ahead uh, with respect to the future developments uh, this is this uh, first step uh, i am a master student now in uh, karabuk university in turkey and this is first step uh, in the accuracy uh, and the information security uh, and the, my future uh, work uh, focused on the network security and uh, want to go deeper uh, in this uh, uh, and about uh, the information security in the future work i want to use the color uh, color image instead of the grayscale image and this uh, study is a grayscale image and the color image is uh, give us a uh, good feature extraction when uses when uses cnn C uh, convolution neural network uh, and the, and and I planning to use other models instead of two models, and want to use uh, three or four models in the future work because if the models one models is fail to detect malware, the others can detect in uh, other methods. Thank you, thank you for your thank you good presentation and nice work. Uh, we hope to see a lot of. Uh, you know, future works happening with respect to your research. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, well, uh, now let us go ahead uh, for the next uh, presentation. I call upon uh, Satvinder uh, Kaur. Uh, Satvinder Kaur? Yes, sir. Good afternoon, all of you. My yeah. name is Satvinder Kaur, and I'm research scholar of Shrikul Granth Sahib Ward University, Fatehgarh Sahib, Punjab. And my research paper is study and analysis of crop insurance in Haryana agriculture. So uh, as you all you know that agriculture is considered as primary sector 
of Indian economy because of three reasons that 70% of Indian population is dependent over the field of agriculture. It constitutes a large share of country's national income, growth of other sectors, and overall economy depends on the performance of the agriculture to, to a considerable extent. So these are the challenges faced by the Indian agriculture sector. First is major crop based stagnation in production, high cost form inputs, depletion of fresh groundwater, exhaustion of soil, globalization impact and farmers suicide. And so the, uh, crop insurance is the main, uh, you can say uh, the source from which we can face the many challenges in agriculture. So the, uh, the main objective of crop insurance is to provide insurance coverage and financial support to the farmers in the event of failure of any of the notified crop as like natural calamities, pest, disease. So this list of uh, crops being covered for insurance different from the state to state, like um, creep, uh, crops like rice, jowar, bajra, moon, cotton, onion, and uh, ravi crops, wheat, grams, uh, sell, uh, sunflower, onion, potatoes. So these crops are insured at the community panchayat level. Crop insurance schemes are immense help to the farmers providing them to the uh, financial secure. So this is the result and analysis. I have uh, I have taken 600 people for my sample size is uh, 600. So this is the um, first table which, which is showing that awareness level among various education level of uh, level of among um, various education uh, quali education qualification of the farmers and this table shows that uh, there's no significant difference towards the awareness level of the crop insurance schemes among various education qualification of the farmers so second table shows the nature of family and awareness level of the crop insurance schemes so I have taken hypothesis like awareness level of the crop insurance scheme not significantly very vary between married and unmarried farmers. And my uh, second hypothesis is awareness level of crop insurance scheme significantly vary between married and unmarried farmers. So this table shows that average awareness course toward crop insurance schemes between nuclear family and joint family. Uh, it explains that joint families were being more awareness than the nuclear family. So third table uh, shows, and this is my fourth paper, uh, table shows, uh, which is according to the family size, which I have discussed. Now this is the table number five, which shows the awareness level among various family sizes of the farmers. Uh, according to this, it, uh, it is uh, statistically concluded that there's a significant difference toward awareness level of the crop insurance scheme among various family size of the farmers. So next table is table number, my table number six is showing that family income and awareness level of the crop insurance schemes. And this shows that average awareness score towards crop insurance schemes among various family income. And it is in concluded that farmers family, which has above rupees five lakh, were having more awareness than other family income groups. And according to table number seven, which shows that uh, null hypothesis rejected and alternate hypothesis accepted, it is statistically reported that there's a significant difference towards awareness level of the crop insurance scheme among various family income of the farmers. So difference on awareness score towards crop insurance scheme among various annual savings. So next table is table number eight, which shows the annual saving and awareness level of the crop insurance schemes. So um, it is reported that farmers family, which has higher annual saving were having more awareness other than the annual savings. So, and according to table number nine, it concluded that null hypothesis accepted and alternate 
hypothesis is rejected. So it is statistically reported that there's no significant difference toward the awareness level of crop insurance scheme among various annual saving of the farmers. So this is the my, uh, conclusion of my research. That is, the finding indicated that in comparison to male farmers, female farmers had a greater level of understanding about the crop insurance. And another finding reveals that older individuals, namely those aged above uh, 50, had high rate of awareness to the younger ones. And when compared to the farmers in low income groups, those in high income groups, uh, according to table number five, which is uh, income group of five lakh or more have a greater level of awareness. So in comparison to farmers who come, who come from nuclear families and those who come from mixed family have a high level of awareness. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Satyendra, ma'am, for, uh, for your wonderful presentation. I to understand what is your sample size? That is 600. Okay. So, is it have, small village or uh, your, what is the geographical area? This is Haryana. I have taken Haryana state from uh, India. Okay. And I have taken Haryana. Yeah, I got it. I'm just asking, like, you know, um, as per the equation of sample uh, percentage, like, you know, what is the total population and then how much is your sample size? That was my question, basically. Okay. Actually, uh, this is uh, actually uh, due to some COVID reasons. I have just selected 600 person for my okay. research study. So, uh, you have reduced or, you know, uh, or is it only from one area or two areas? Like how many farmers stay there? I have taken two districts. Uh, one okay. Nagar and another one is Ambala in Haryana okay. state. Uh -huh. So I have taken my sample from these two state, uh, two districts. Okay, okay, sure. Sounds good. Uh, yeah, mm, nothing much because I just wanted to understand all this sample total population of the sample. You have any idea or account there? How much sample population? How did you collect the data with respect to the total population on what basis? Like. How many population uh, do the crop or farming out there? So mostly in Haryana, almost 90% of the people are doing agriculture. Okay. So I have, yes, sir. As we know, 70% of the India uh, pop, Indian population does in the uh, field of agriculture. So, yes. and Haryana state is, and Punjab, these North India have uh, opportunity of these crop insurance and crop loan schemes. And I belong to the Punjab, but in Punjab, there's no crop insurance schemes. So okay. I have taken uh, Haryana state. Okay, okay. Fine. And uh, on what basis the questionnaires were framed? Sir, uh, I have framed questions on the basis of uh, like awareness. Uh, I want to check the awareness level of the farmers. So I have... Like question testing will be there, crown batch alpha testing, all you need to do. All those things, right? Uh, when you frame query questionnaires, right? Uh, questions you need to basically there is cron batch alpha value you need to get, uh, or uh, you know there is some uh, question test you need to do, or there should be like primary data, secondary data, like on what right. basis, I right? On what data is that the questions you only framed, or is it taken through literature review? Sir, I have taken these uh, question from literature review. Okay. Yeah, that is what I was asking. Fine. Yes. Sounds good. Good efforts. 600 is a small sample though. Right. Uh, if you can increase the sample again, that would be great uh, to get a proper results. And yes, sir. Get a good that, conclusion. That my research, uh, PhD research, this is my uh, also my topic of uh, my PhD. So I will uh, la uh, take a large uh, sample size in my. Or PhD. restrict and tell uh, not enter. Don't mention it as a state reduce it into two district or one district or you know make it much more smaller uh, as a village or something three village or four village just just reduce your geographical boundaries okay, that would so be apt solution uh, so that uh, uh, we can get a more accurate results uh, uh, of this particular place this is so and so kind of it right? so that so would be one of my suggestion that's it advice thank you thank you, thank you. good research good effort call uh, um, there is a request from uh, anas 
Yeah, and as well, dear conference organizer, uh, dear moderator, thank you very much for understanding the situation regarding some changes uh, uh, in the possible uh, line and the possible sequence uh, of this present. Dear colleagues, uh, my pleasure to be with you, and I would like uh, to introduce my humble uh, contribution uh, to the research regarding. Uh, the role of language in the legislation development. I come from Rudan University, Moscow, Russian Federation, and I work uh, at the Institute of Law. Uh, practically and initially, I'm the linguist and the legal translator, but I held a second degree in criminal proceedings. Uh, and uh, right now, I can say for sure that uh, the uh, quality of legal documents uh, is largely determined uh, by the quality of language. And this in turn influences the further development and the further enforcement uh, of the legal uh, language. I should say that, is it okay with the slide, colleagues? Uh, yeah? Uh, the idea is uh, that uh, we uh, have to uh, think of both uh, legal positions, legal statements, and the use of language to express these legal positions uh, regarding both national and international legislations. Uh, the current research task um, was uh, associated with the analysis of activities from varied national stakeholders uh, within the, uh, our country experience. However, I worked uh, for five years in the Council of Europe Committee uh, for one of the conventions regarding the protection of children from abuse and exploitation. And we had to produce a lot of our national le legislation uh, for the information purpose. Thus, we had to translate our legislation to explain colleagues uh, the national legal background. And again, uh, we understood uh, that a language uh, plays an important role, uh, both within national and international legal activities. Uh, we do understand uh, that uh, we uh, need to provide good training uh, to prepare lawyers for this uh, language and law activities. Therefore, our second task was to specify the need for university-based academic activities uh, regarding comprehensive approach to legal professionals training uh, in terms of further professionals, uh, language uh, competence uh, with reference to legal drafting. Uh, and furthermore, as far as the contemporary world uh, develops as the multilingual environment, we argue for the importance of training multilingual lawyers and linguists maybe for the purpose of legal documents drafting within international context and national developments. Uh, the slide shows you uh, the research materials uh, and the methodologies that mostly use comparative analysis, observation, and con conceptual mapping. Uh, in the course of our finding, and I should say that we have looked through over uh, 560 samples of the documents uh, and uh, each document volume uh, varies uh, among 10 to uh, 30 pages of either legal document or legal regulations or legal recommendations, etc. Uh, our findings are as follows. First, everyone recognizes the importance of the linguistic component in the course of lawmaking activities. Uh, second, uh, the issue of the uh, language importance, the issue of the language quality in the lawmaking process uh, should be considered uh, within uh, the level of the university-based uh, academic research and instruction. Next, uh, the issue of lawmaking quality with reference to language use is subject to the relevant personnel training. 
and uh, the international contexts and needs are to be considered as well. Uh, as far as the national context of my country is concerned, uh, there is a system of regulatory and expert analytical measures from the part of the public authorities. Moreover, uh, there is a system of educational measures in law schools and graduate law schools. So lawyers are trained, future lawyers, or to be are trained uh, within a special course on legal writing. Moreover, uh, there is a consistent research uh, conducted both by lawyers and linguists regarding the legal language use and practice. However, there are some challenges. All those resources, uh, namely those regulations regarding language use and legal document drafting, uh, are targeted, first of all, at professionals already working in the relevant legal field, uh, they do not assume that uh, these recommendations uh, are to be read by students. Uh, the next idea, uh, the university training level of specialists uh, should comprise uh, the modules or the parts of the uh, special training courses uh, which focus on the work with language component within the legal document drafting. Uh, and uh, all those regulations and uh, recommendations, uh, as well as the analytical documents regarding the current uh, language use within the legislation enforcement, are to be introduced in the educational courses, because so far the situation is not so. Uh, then, uh, to this end, we need to include in the textbooks on speech culture of the law, as we have such courses, or in legal drafting practice, some specific modules uh, that train students uh, to correct mistakes, to analyze uh, pitfalls and um, promising practice regarding the language use. So these textbooks and teaching aids should be very practical. Uh, further, uh, we need a more united approach of lawyers and linguists regarding the scientific analysis of the legal language. We need their joint work and uh, the applied results to be introduced into the future lawyers training. Uh, the results should be uh, introduced in the respective teaching aids. Uh, furthermore, as I have already mentioned, uh, in the contemporary multilingual world, uh, the multilingual presentation of national legislation is very important. Uh, both in terms of uh, comparative practice, comparative analysis, and within the applied field, because nationals travel across the world, sometimes they are subject to the legislation in another country, and they need to understand the legislation of another country. Therefore, this legislation should be translated into several languages. My experience of working in the Council of Europe reveals that as far as, for example, Russian legislation is concerned, we have very poor translation into English or French. And even more, when we worked with the Council of Europe for the past five years, we had to provide a new translation version of the documents that are already uh, provided as open access in the internet. Uh, it means that multilingual, uh, applied training of lawyers and linguists as specialists in the field of legal translation uh, comes to be a real task for universities, for law schools today. Uh, basing on the uh, above points on uh, everything mentioned earlier, uh, I would like to uh, provide, to draw your attention to those recommendations that we have shaped with my colleagues. Uh, you see them on the slide. So first, it is very important to correct, uh, to revisit um, the concept of university training of lawmaking professionals. Uh, this revision might include joint design of training materials by the specialists in the field of jurisprudence and language, the inclusion of disciplines within the legal writing technique, in the instruction process with systemic emphasis 
of practical tasks uh, that provide not only the assignment uh, regarding the development of legal text drafting, but also the task to edit and um, correct and prove uh, the legal draft text. Further, there might be in use and need interdisciplinary educational programs, master courses, professional conversion courses, as well as CPD courses to train specialists in the field of multilingual lawmaking by integrating disciplines in jurisprudence, national and foreign languages, and artificial intelligence technologies of text processing and modeling in several languages. Uh, and of course, we might need uh, some targeted or so-called bespoke training uh, for uh, some uh, kinds of specialists or public authorities involved in the process of multilingual lawmaking activities. Uh, second, um, we know that regarding the uh, legal translation and uh, interpreting activities in many countries, there are national registers of certified court and sworn interpreters, but they provide their oral services mostly for police and court. However, uh, for multilingual state, uh, the importance of its national legislation awareness in several languages comprises not only the work within uh, major, you know, languages, but also uh, that uh, seems to be obvious, but also within a multilingual environment of a particular state. So these are major points that I would like to draw your attention to while introducing the issues of the language importance within the legal process, uh, lingual documents, legislation drafting. Thank you very much. I'm ready to reply to your questions, if any. Thank you. Thank you, wonderful presentation, ma'am. Uh, nice uh, to learn a few things from you and the suggestions also. Yeah, uh, we will we will be in touch, ma'am. Uh, please share your email yeah. address. Right. Uh, we Thank will you. Now to get in touch. I will put you. it in the chat. I appreciate your attention. I'm sure to appreciate my email in the chat. Thank you. Yes, we will get in touch with you. Thanks. Thanks yeah. a lot. Thank nice you very much. Presentation. Yes. So, well, um, now I would like to next uh, call upon the presenter. Uh, do we have a uh, Sithil Chantamali? Yeah, yes. Yeah, His okay. colleagues been in. Yes, sir. Yeah, please uh, do share your presentation. Yes, uh, I can see it. Okay. Thank good evening, good evening, everybody. Thank you sir, for your coming to my presentation. I am Mr. Sitilit Jantamali, and I am study at Chiang Mai University's Department of uh, Mechanical Engineering. The study paper that uh, we work in uh, a part of system in geothermal power plants and uh, the topic of my presentation is uh, optimal alternative to change uh, the production value of geothermal power plant by machine learning. Okay, so under contains, uh, we have uh, intro six contains uh, for the present two days. The next slide is uh, introduction. The located of uh, geothermal power plants. In case study, we have the found geothermal power plants uh, located in northern of Thailand, and the uh, capacity capacity install is the uh, about uh, three hundred uh, kilowatts. On the patients uh, have a uh, true objective. The first uh, to uh, apply artificial neural networks algorithm to predictive maintenance the production value of the functional thermal. Uh, second, select the 
ANN for predictive maintenance to optimal the power production according to economic analysis at the farm geothermals. Scope of work. There are three scopes uh, in this reserve. The first one uh, select the case it found geothermal uh, located in Chiang Mai district, Chiang Mai province. Second, the data used in study have uh, four years on the losses in the plants with uh, collection by the operators. And finally, select the artificial neural networks uh, for predictive maintenance the production well. Methodologies in the slides. This slide is a uh, show the overview of the reserve. First part, pass uh, machine learning techniques, methodology reviews, and then select the data device on the two sections uh, for the training and testing modules. It's the result is cast uh, CIFI data in three level for maintenance activity. And finally, after this is the result from the models uh, is uh, evaluated by the economic analysis. Uh, the economic analysis uh, follow with the formulas of average per, per year. Process of neural networks. There are three layers uh, in the neural networks in cloud, the input layers, hidden layers, and output layers. And this uh, each layer is the interconnected on the nodes. Process of the reserve. The diagram of the predictive maintenance methodology in, the, in this reserve, uh, number one to five uh, is a source of the data and determine 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 of the goals and Number six, select the NN models to predict alternative class levels on the outputs. Number seven to number nine is the alternate to decision making on the maintenance of the production well. This line is the data set of the NN models uh, they pass the two section. First, uh, data training, and second, the data testing. <clears throat> the data includes the 147 instance for the training modules uh, have uh, 36 pillars of the time operations and the test. Data test module have uh, five pillars of time operations. This slide is a diagram of preventive maintenance methodologies uh, but with the machine learning. First, uh, the data collections uh, from the farm geothermals, uh, after that, uh, we cleaning and mixing the data for reduce the model uh, domains of the data. Next, next step, uh, so setting the goal of the training and testing says the, the AN models have uh, automatic learnings for predicts the class levels on the class zero, ones and class two. On this reserve, the predictions of the model is uh, Accepting all these uh, class sales. Next slide is the results. This list is the evaluation. 
of the application in in algorithms uh, alongside economic analysis to select optimal maintenance schedule for operating machines and the data of a uh, training model is divided in three cars uh, cellos one and two the cellos the class cello that means the normal operations class one mean uh, analysis maintenance and class two re request of the maintenance this slide show the maintenance decision of pm methods uh, on the slide on the research uh, ascertain only the class zero to normal operation the the AN model prediction uh, says satellite uh, to assess in the review cellos means uh, operation can continuously. The maintenance at calls to prediction in class review cellos, the power production was increased on average about uh, 276,000. 444 kilowatt hour with uh, reasons and increase around uh, 17.51 percent. Did the secretions of the benefits on the reserve? Did is the curve of the increase of power generations after ascertain in car cello conclusion the end model is user pans the maintenance process in the fangio power power pans are appropriately the end model so ascertain certainly and Predictly solvers persist. This model assists the operator can further visualize monitoring and decision making for a suitable of time for maintenance. And then the AN model is a appropriate maintenance practice that can lead to efficiency and small profits. Finally, the calculating economic benefits in the long term are so the cost benefit in 20 years. Uh, we can save around the 2 million and 299,100 and 77. 27 baht in the money values for the FAGO power pants. Okay, so this presentation is finished already. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for your presentation and very nice to see implementation of uh, technologies like a and, and you know uh your data the technology the recent technologies in the field of geothermal right i wanted to understand what uh, right up uh, the results comparison when you did uh with respect to the results what you got uh through the data uh, which you have collected and the implementation of the results have you got it the comparison between them have you got the result uh, as the same as expected yeah yes uh, the result is uh, compared with the cost benefits uh, on the traditional activity and the new activity for the maintenance the, this paper is the new activity maintained by the neural networks to predict the class levels for the maintenance in the suitable of time. Okay. 
Yes, sounds good. Very nice uh, presentation. Nice to hear. Uh, good efforts. We'll be in touch. Uh, thank you for your presentation, sir. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. So now uh, let me call upon uh, the next presenter, uh, Sukuman Dardi. Uh, we are not able to. We are not. Uh, we, we are not able to hear you. Um, can you are you there? Maybe some earphone issues. I believe. Am I audible? Yeah. Now we are audible. Hello, everyone. I am Sukhmandi Paul, such scholar from Gunanik Dev University, Amritsar, Punjab, India. And here is my PPT. My paper title is Effect of Ice. City integration. Is it visible? Uh, it's showing still it is sharing. Yes, sir. Not yet, ma'am. We are just waiting to see. I mean, it is showing you have started share screening. We are not yet able to see though. But yeah, please go ahead. We'll see. And maybe a technical issues or internet issues, I believe. We are not able to see the screen still. It is showing that you have started share screening. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Yeah, please share the screen first, ma'am. Please share the screen now. Yeah. And now we have now we are seeing. Please sir. go ahead. My paper titles is effect of ICT integration with the inquiry training model on problem solving ability. Here is my abstract. I will start with introduction. Information and communication technology is an extremely impressive force which lastly affects each part of our life. Traditional teaching methods are quickly ceasing to exist and are being supplanted by current strategies that have their own assets and shortcomings. In order to overcome such drawbacks, ICT is presently checking down wide pertinence the world over. From the related searches, it has been found that ICT can raise the level of education in more ways than one by escalating learners' academic achievement and problem-solving ability. There is no denying the fact that technology in the present scenario is utilized progressively, particularly for teaching learning process. This was on the grounds that latest technology equips the classrooms with numerous instruments that can be utilized in enhancing the quality of education process. With the appearance of inventive advancements, specifically the Web2 innovation and compelling instructive programs, instructors might help the undertaking of the redesigning further different student-focused techniques of learning. Like this, WebQuest is one of the methodologies for the proficient use of innovation in the classroom setup. WebQuest is a Web2 inquiry-based learning design utilized by teachers to advance their problem-solving ability skills in different viewpoints and to sort out student-focused learning in a particular subject with the assistance of free chosen internet resources. WebQuest is becoming popular as a rising learning technology and has been a supplementary illustration of how to efficiently integrate technology in education. WebQuest was first introduced by Bernie Dodge of San Diego State University in 1995 and then later on upgraded by Tom March in 1998. According to Bernie Dodge, WebQuest is an inquiry-oriented activity in which some or all of the information that learners interact with comes from resources on the internet. The main objectives of my present study are to study the effect of different modes of instruction vis-a-vis -vis conventional teaching method, inquiry training model, and ICT integration with the inquiry training model, basically uh, the application of WebQuest on the, on the gain scores of problem solving ability in physics. And the second is to study the interaction effect of modes of instruction and gender on the gain scores of problem solving ability in physics. And the main hypothesis of the study there is no senior difference in different modes of instruction vis-a-vis -vis con conventional teaching method, inquiry training model, and ICT integration with the inquiry training model on the gain scores of problem solving ability in physics. And the second is, there is no significant difference in problem solving ability gain scores in physics between male and female students. And the third is, there is no interaction between modes of instruction and gender on the gain scores of problem solving ability in physics. And the present study was confined to CBSC school students of CBSE uh, is the Central Board of Secondary Education. 
school students of Amritsar city of Punjab state India. Data was collected from students of ninth class for teaching the concepts of physics subjects only. And uh, the sample that for the present study data was collected from ninth class of four CBSE schools of Amritsar city of Punjab state. Three modes of instruction were employed. First one was conventional teaching method means teaching students through normal uh, teaching methods. And second, a group was taught through inquiry training model. And the third was ICT integration with the inquiry training model, that is the application of WebQuest, and thus designed three groups. Problem solving ability test for physics employed as pre test before teaching and as post test after teaching all the three groups for collecting the data. Experimental research method was employed in the present study. And a total sample of 459 students constituted the sample of the study with 153 for each group. The tools used, all the tools were validated by the experts of science education and all the tools prepared by the investigator herself. Uh, the tools are problem solving ability test in physics, lesson plans based on inquiry training model and web test based modules, including the inquiry training model principles. For collecting the data, firstly, problem solving ability pretest was ad administered on all the three groups. Students of group one taught with conventional teaching methods, second group taught with the inquiry training model, and the third group with the ICT integration with ITM, that is web test approach. And at the end, problem solving ability post test was employed on all the three groups. And after administration, scoring was carried out as per the proposed marking criteria. And thus, the pretest and post test scores of problem solving ability test comprise each other for the current study. Data analysis. Analysis was done by applying statistical techniques such as mean standard deviation and ANOVA. The data obtained have been analyzed by three by two analysis of variance on the gain scores of problem solvability in relation to modes of instruction and gene. And the means and standard deviation of subgroups for three by two factorial design of ANOVA on the gain scores of problem solvability in relation to modes of instruction and gender have been calculated and presented as. Like in this table, we can see that for uh, CTM stands for conventional teaching method. That is the first group. Second is inquiry training model. And the third one is ICT and inquiry training models. It is very much clear from the data. N stands for number of students. M is mean and ST is standard deviation. We can uh, come across uh, the conclusion that the students taught with ICT and inquiry training model, their mean is high as compared to other two modes of instruction. And for analysis of variance in problem solving ability, acquired scores have been subjected to ANOVA and the results have been presented. And it has been observed that the, uh, for the main effects, only modes of instruction result was found to be significant at the 0 0.01 level of confidence. It may be observed from the present table that F ratio for the difference between means of different modes of instruction on the gain scores of problem solving ability in physics has been found to be significant at the 0 0.01 level of confidence. So the data provides sufficient evidence to reject the first hypothesis, that is there is no significant difference in different modes of instruction vis-a-vis -vis conventional teaching method, inquiry training model, and ICT integration with the inquiry training model on the gain scores of problem solving ability in physics. So it indicates that there is significant difference in different modes of instruction on the gain scores of problem solving ability in physics, and further the analysis of mean table, which I have shown you recently, uh, that students start with the approach of ICT integration with the current training model, their mean is higher. So it means that they are showing higher problem solving ability as compared to other two modes of instruction. And further to analyze deeper, uh, Key analysis for the difference in means of various subgroups of modes of instruction, the same uh, gain scores of problem solving ability has also been computed as uh, it is represented here. It has been observed from the table that the 10 value of T ratios for the difference between the means have been found to be significant at 0 0.01 level of confidence. This suggests that students taught with conventional teaching method means regular teaching method, they are having lower problem solving ability as compared to the other two modes of instruction. And it is also clear from the table that students start with inquiry training model, they are having sure they have showed minimum problem solving ability as compared to the students who, who have taught with the web test approach or ICT integration with the inquiry training model group. So for gender B, it has been observed from the table that F ratio for the difference between male and female student has not been found significant at 0 0.01 level of confidence. So the data did not provide sufficient evidence to reject the hypothesis second. 
so it indicates that there is no significant difference in problem solvability gain scores in physics between male and female students and for the interaction effect it has been clear that uh, f ratio for the interaction between modes of instruction and gender on the gain scores of problem solving ability has not been found significant at 0.01 level of confidence thus the data did not provide sufficient evidence to reject the third hypothesis that is there is no interaction between modes of instruction and gender on the gain scores of problem solving ability in physics so it indicates that there exists no significant difference in the interaction effect of both modes of instruction and gender so Uh, from this study it has been concluded that the present investigation is showing some trend concerning modes of instruction with a vis conventional teaching method and inquiry training model and iset integration with inquiry training model so findings of the current study indicated that there is significant difference in different modes of instruction on the gain scores of problem solving ability in physics it was observed that there is no significant difference in problem solving ability gain scores in physics between male and female students means boys and girls it could be inferred that ict integration that is web based with itm means inquiry training model works better as compared to other two modes of instruction so this framework can be replicated in different sample circumstances variables and practices for better results thank you thank you ma'am for your wonderful presentation